we cannot see the throne, but we're worshiping before the throne. And the Lord on the throne hears and accepts our worship, and we are in His presence today. And furthermore, we look forward to the day when we are before the throne in heaven, worshiping Him for all of eternity. Now this morning, our scripture is found in the second chapter of the book of Revelation. We are in the second part of the book of Revelation. In chapter 1, verse 19, John is told to write the things which he has seen, the vision of Christ in chapter 1. That's the first part. Then he is told to write the things which are the seven churches of Asia in chapters 2 and 3. And then third, he is told to write the things which shall be after these, chapter 4 to the end of the book. So in chapters 2 and 3, the risen Lord is speaking to seven literal churches, but they are also symbolic of every church of all the churches in all the ages. And they contain great lessons for every individual believer. What you may or may not know is that many Bible scholars consider the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3 to be an overview or an outline of the entire church age in which we live. We start with the church at Ephesus, a church which was losing its first love. That's the church of John's day, at the end of the days of the apostles. Then there is the church of Smyrna, a church under persecution, the church in the great persecutions between 100 and 300 A.D., Next is the church of Pergamum, the church that is married to the world. And that's the church when Constantine became the emperor of the Roman Empire in 316 A.D. And he said, from now on, I am a Christian emperor and Rome is a Christian empire. And the state and the church were wedded together. The fourth church is Thyatira, a church of compromise and idolatry and immorality. That's the church of the Middle Ages, the church of the Dark Ages, the church of medieval times. Fifth is the church of Sardis. The church of Sardis had a remnant, and God encourages that remnant. That's the church of of the Reformation, a church where a few of the lights had not yet gone out but were burning for God. Sixth is the church of Philadelphia, the church of the open door, the church of great opportunity. That's the church of the great awakenings under John Wesley, George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, That's the church of the modern missionary movement under William Carey, Adoniram Judson, Lottie Moon, and many others. That's the church of great evangelists, Billy Sunday, Dwight L. Moody, R.A. Torrey, Billy Graham, the Philadelphia age of the church. But the seventh church is Laodicea, the church of the end times, the church as it is just before Jesus returns. That's a church where there is neither heat nor cold, but the church is lukewarm. That's the church where Jesus is standing on the outside as he is many churches today, wanting to be admitted to the inside. So Bible scholars say, many of them, that these seven churches are a portrayal 
of the whole age between the first coming and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Smyrna, the church we look at today, is the church under persecution. And God's word for this church is the word suffering. We read in Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold the devil is about to cast some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. The word Smyrna, before you get to the book of Revelation, is used three times in the New Testament. But in none of these does it refer to the city of Smyrna. In each case is translated myrrh because Smyrna was the Greek word for myrrh. The first instance is in Matthew chapter 2 when the Magi come from the east to see the newborn Messiah and they bring their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Gold was the gift for a king. Frankincense was offered by the priest. Myrrh was used to embalm the dead. So those three gifts are symbolic of Jesus. He is gold, the king. He is given frankincense. He is our great high priest. And he is presented with myrrh, a foreshadowing of his suffering. Gold and frankincense and, in the Greek, Smyrna. The second instance is in Mark chapter 15, the crucifixion. As Jesus agonizes upon the cross, some folks below offer to him a drink of wine mingled with Smyrna or myrrh, a combination that was used as an analgesic, a pain reliever to alleviate suffering. And the third instance in the gospel according to John, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, after Jesus has died, come and place the body of Jesus in a borrowed tomb and they wrap it in aloes and smyrna or myrrh. So the word for myrrh in the Greek is smyrna and in each case it has reference to suffering. Gold, frankincense, smyrna, looking to our Lord's death on the crucifixion, offered Smyrna to drink, suffering. At the resurrection, his body wrapped in Smyrna, a portrayal of suffering. Now the city of Smyrna was one of the most beautiful cities in ancient time. It was sometimes called the ornament of Asia or the crown of Asia, or the flower of Asia. Ancient Smyrna was one of the few planned cities in the world. It was planned before ever a street was paved, before ever a house was built, before ever a stone was unturned. The streets in Smyrna 
being planned were broad and straight. One of the streets was called the Street of Gold. It led from the temple of Zeus to the temple of Sibylle. Smyrna still exists today, but it's not called Smyrna anymore. It's called Izmir. You can hear the similarity in those words. Smyrna was the Greek. Izmir is just a Turkish corruption of Smyrna. Today, Izmir is the third largest city in Turkey. Istanbul is the largest. Ankara, the capital, is second. Smyrna is third. Izmir with a population of 3,400,000 people. So what was a medium-sized city in the Lord's day is an enormous city in Turkey today. There were only two churches of these seven that Jesus addresses in Revelation, of which the Lord had no criticism. One of them is Smyrna. The other is Philadelphia. Notice, Smyrna, the church suffering for the Lord, and Jesus has no criticism, only encouragement. Philadelphia, the church of the open door, faithfully serving the Lord, and again, no criticism, only a word of encouragement for those that are serving Christ to the maximum. Why was Smyrna particularly a church under suffering and a church under persecution? Well, Smyrna was the center of East Caesar worship in that part of the Roman Empire. Every year, a Roman citizen was required to have a certificate of loyalty to Caesar. Now, you're familiar with things like that. If the red lights or blue lights go on behind your car and you pull over, you are required to have a driver's license. You are required to have proof of liability insurance. In the ancient Roman Empire, every citizen had to possess a certificate of loyalty to Caesar, and it was good for a period of one year. had to be renewed every year. And here is how you renewed it. You went to a shrine where there was a statue of Caesar. You put a pinch of incense on a little fire in front of the statue and you repeated the three words, Caesar is Lord. And when you said that, you were given your certificate of loyalty. You had to have that certificate to get a job. You had to have that certificate to serve in the military. You had to have that certificate to be legal and not illegal. Caesar is Lord. Now, the Romans did not really believe that Caesar was a god. They were not testing your religious beliefs. You could be a Jew. You could be a pagan. You could be a Christian. But if you were willing to drop the incense and say Caesar is Lord, you were given your certificate of loyalty. You see, the Roman Empire was very scattered. It was diverse. It was made up of many ethnicities. It was made up of many religious groups. Caesar was not testing your religious beliefs. He was testing your political loyalty. You could not have an army big enough to keep all of those groups and all of those states together. And so, 
you had Caesar worship. It was one thing in common by which people annually pledged their loyalty to Caesar. It was a political statement. And if you didn't do it, you were subject to persecution. Now these Christians at Smyrna were being persecuted. But if you will open your eyes just a little bit, you'll see that Christians all over the world are still being persecuted. There is physical persecution. Just over a week ago, 21 professing Christians were put to death by an Islamic radical group. They were beheaded simultaneously. That's persecution. There is economic persecution. To this day, if you live in a country where the Communist Party rules, you cannot be a member of the Communist Party unless you are an atheist. And unless you're a member of the Communist Party, you are at the bottom of the list for being admitted to universities. You have no educational opportunities. You are at the bottom of the list when it comes to employment. The bottom of the list when it comes to promotion. The bottom of the list when it comes to status in society or high paying positions. Christians are still persecuted economically, psychologically. Here's a teenager on a high school or middle school campus and abstains from drugs, abstains from sex outside of marriage, abstains from vulgar language and off-color jokes. There can be psychological persecution, and the same thing can happen with adults. One part of the Bible that we sometimes leave out is the teaching of Scripture that if you are a Christian you will experience persecution. Philippians 1.29 says, For unto you it is given, it's a gift, on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. That's a gift of God if you're a Christian. And again in 2 Timothy chapter 3.12, all that live godly in Christ Jesus, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If there is no persecution, if you're never criticized, if you're never laughed at, if you're never ignored, if you're never excluded because of your Christian faith, the probability is that you're not giving a clear and consistent witness before the world. But dear people, there are lots of suffering beyond persecution. And the principles we're going to share this morning have to do with all suffering. Whether it's a marital problem, whether it's issues of parenting, whether it's a job-related situation, or a health concern, God has a word for you about suffering. And the word is in verse 10. Don't be afraid of the things you're going to suffer. When you suffer, God's word to you is, don't be afraid. And the rest of the scripture tells us why you don't need to be afraid. You can overcome that fear of suffering. First, if you will tell yourself, I belong to the triumphant, sovereign, risen Lord, and He is in control. Look at what the Bible says in verse 8. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last, who was dead 
and has come to life says this. Jesus is first and last. He was before your suffering. He will be after your suffering. He is in the midst of your suffering. He is with you. He is totally in control. And then he says, I was dead and I'm alive forevermore. The Greek literally reads, I became dead. He died on the cross, but he arose and he is alive forevermore. You belong to the one who is in charge. You belong to the one who is the Lord God of all creation. In the olden times, before Columbus, if you would look at maps of the world, you would see vast uncharted areas. And on them, you might have written, Here be dragons, an area where nobody had explored. Here be burning sands, maybe where they had looked into the desert, but never gone into the desert. Here is an abyss where it looked like the horizon ended. But you and I as Christians can ride across the whole world. Everywhere is Jesus because he is in control. And that's the first thing to remind yourself. You belong to the one who is in charge and nothing happens that is more powerful than he. Secondly, the Lord says, when you suffer, say to yourself, Jesus knows my afflictions. Again, in verse 9, the Bible says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Jesus says, I know. I know your tribulation. The Greek word there is thalipsis. It means to press or to crush. It was the word used when you would crush grapes to make wine or when you would crush grain to make flour. Have you ever felt overwhelmed, loaded down, crushed? Jesus says, I know about that. I know about your poverty. Why would these Christians in Smyrna be poor? Well, to begin with, most of them were probably converts out of slavery. And they were poor to begin with. But beyond that, as Christians, without that certificate of loyalty to Caesar, they couldn't join a trade union. They couldn't be hired by an employer. And the word used for poor is not the customary word penes, which might be the working poor, but it's the word patokos. It means utter, sheer destitution. Do you ever experience a financial hardship? Jesus says, I know all about that. But notice he says, you are really rich. Refocus off of what you don't have to the real riches that you do have. Your sins have been forgiven. You possess eternal life now and forever. The risen Lord lives inside of you and he's watching over you. You are an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. As a servant, you cooperate with Jesus in doing his work. You have by the Holy Spirit a foretaste of heaven in your heart now. And one day you will reign with Christ on the earth and you will live with him in heaven for all of eternity. You may say, I'm poor, but you're really rich. Then the Lord says, I know the blasphemy. The word blasphemy can be applied either to God or to man. It means an insult, to insult somebody. When applied to God, 
we translate it often blasphemy. When applied to man, slander. Have you ever been slandered? Has anybody ever reported about you something that wasn't true? Has anybody ever made you the victim of gossip or told something about you and left part out or added part thereto? Mistreated you with their tongue? Jesus says, I know all about that. Now, how does Jesus know it? Well, he knows it not only because he just knows all things, but he's been there and he's experienced it. What tribulation could you have that would compare to what Jesus felt? What poverty have you ever faced that would compare with our Lord's poverty when he lived on earth? What slander could you ever face that would compare with the revilings directed against the Lord Jesus Christ? Notice that Jesus says, you're slandered by those who say they are Jews, but they're really a synagogue of Satan. In other words, the ultimate source behind your suffering may well be Satan. So you know what we do? We're sick. We lose a job. Our kid does something stupid. We do something stupid. Why did God let this happen to me? Well, God may have permitted it, but folks, the ultimate source of many of your problems is Satan. That's where Job's health problems came from. Satan afflicted him. And that's where Paul's thorn in the flesh came from. Paul said, There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan. To buffet me. So remember when you suffer that Jesus knows all about it. And then the third thing, you don't have to be afraid because there is a limit to your suffering. The scripture says in verse 10, you're going to be suffering tribulation for 10 days but be faithful unto death and I'll give you a crown of life. Not a hundred days, not a thousand days, not forever, ten days. Now ten in the Bible is a number of intensification. Like forty is four intensified. And seventy is seven intensified. The book of Exodus talks about ten plagues on the land of Egypt. Intensification. But it's limited. Sometimes God steps in and delivers. He may not do it on our timetable. He delivered Joseph from prison all the way to prime minister. But Joseph languished a long time in that dungeon before he was elevated. It happened, but not on Joseph's timetable. Sometimes God says, I'm not going to deliver you here on this earth. But even if he doesn't, then there is heaven with no more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering. There is a limit to your suffering. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. Was there ever a friend like the lowly Jesus? No, not one. No, not one. But let me add another word. You don't have to be afraid in time of suffering because God has promised a special crown for those who suffer faithfully. In verse 10, it is called the crown of life. Now, true, 
the church at Smyrna was suffering uniquely. Persecution. But did you know there is another reference to the crown of life in the New Testament where it is expanded beyond persecution to all of our testings and tribulation? And that is James 1.12. Blessed is the man that endures testing, for when he is tried, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those that love Him. One of the most famous pastors in the history of the Christian church was the pastor of the church at Smyrna shortly after John wrote this letter. His name was Polycarp. He was put to death as a Christian martyr on February 23rd, tomorrow. But it was a Saturday then. February 23rd, 155 A.D. Polycarp had a dream one night. And in his dream, his pillow was on fire. So when he awakened, he said to his friends, his disciples, God has told me that I'm going to be burned to death. So one day they came and they arrested Polycarp on February 23rd. And uh, they took him down to the arena where the public executions were held. And Polycarp said, I have one request. Will you give me an hour for prayer? And the arresting officers took an hour and they went and ate lunch. And Polycarp prayed for an hour. The police captain came to Polycarp and sympathet sympathetically said to him, what harm could there possibly be in saying Caesar is Lord? Everybody knows you don't mean it. Just say it and spare your life. But Polycarp refused to do that. They took him and led him into the arena the crowds were cheering wildly, wanting blood. The Roman proconsul in charge of the ceremony said to Polycarp, you have a choice. You may curse Jesus Christ and put the incense before this emperor and say Caesar is Lord and live. Or you may die. Polycarp answered, Eighty and six years have I served my Savior and He has never wronged me. Why would I curse Him now? The Roman proconsul said, If you don't, we will burn you to death. Polycarp said, you know all about the fire which burns here for a short period. You know nothing about the fire which burns forever for those who don't know Christ. What you have to do, he said, get on with it. And they burned him to death, glorifying God, faithful unto death. I don't know what your suffering is, but verse 10 is God's verse to you this week. Be faithful in it if it means your death. Be faithful until your death, and the Lord will give you a crown of life. So God's word to the church is suffering, but in God's time, in God's way, suffering becomes victory and suffering will receive His reward. We're going to conclude the service today with a time of invitation. In just a moment, we're going to stand together and sing together. And as we do, it could be that there is one 
or several who would say, today I want to commit my life to Christ and pledge my service and loyalty to Him. I want to trust Him as my Savior. We invite you to step out and come. And by your coming say, I want to confess Christ as my Lord and my Savior. We invite you to come and join First Baptist Church by transferring your membership. We invite you to come in rededication of your heart and life to doing the will of God. Maybe you've been saved but never baptized and you want to come and follow the Lord in believer's baptism. We invite you to come as well. Let's stand together as we sing our hymn of invitation together. If Christ is calling, you come. <laughs>